Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn our attention to verse 2 of hymn 306. We meet as in the upper room they met, thou at the table blessing yet dost stand this is my body so thou givest yet faith still receives the cup and we will cross that off as problematic we turn our attention now to Hans Kyung Yves Conger, Dominican, and Daniel Hanlon, a Jesuit on the Council Speeches of Vatican II, written in 1964 as the Council was underway, published by Deus Books. Most recent book we we're processing is a one written in 2013, Can We Save the Catholic Church? Sounds a bit desperate, doesn't it? I wonder if Ratzinger's gonna appear in this, or JP2. Published in New Jersey by Paulist Press, 1964, which means editor's preface, dedication, Christ the beginning, the goal of the council. Pope Paul VI. Okay, I forgot about him. Yeah, he was next after 23. John 23, self-awareness of the church. The task, Paul VI, Bishop of Rome. The Charismatic Dimension of the Church, Cardinal Ian Swains, Archbishop of Mecklen, Brussels. Importance of the Local Church, Edward Schick, Auxiliary Bishop of Fulda, Priesthood of All Believers, Emil Joseph de Schmidt, Bishop of Brugge. So these are the sin in the Holy Church of God, Stephen Laszlo, Bishop of Eisenstadt, Eastern and Western Tradition in One Church, Elias Zogby, Greek Melkite Patriarchal Vicar in Egypt. Collegiality in the New Testament, Paul Roosh, Bishop of Innsbruck. Collegiality in the early church tradition, Paul Guyen, Coadjutor Archbishop of Rennes. Significance of Consecration, Michael Duma, Maronite Bishop of Serba. Papal Infallibility in the Church. Joseph Descuffy, Archbishop of Smyrna, eleven servant of the servants of God, Maximus, Pat Patriarch of Antioch. Part two, renewal of the church, the task, Pope Paul VI, Bishop of Rome. Why is he, uh, when did 23 die and when did Paul VI He's being called Pope VI in 1964. I've got to get my time right. Responsible Freedom of the Layman, Ernest Primo, Bishop of Manchester. The lay apostolate and principal of subsidiary, Joseph Hefner, Bishop of Münster. Holiness of all in the church, Cardinal Paul Emil Legger, Archbishop of Montreal. These look like three pages. Evangelical Perfection, Gerhard Hugi, Bishop of Arras, Pastoral Need of Permanent Deacons, Ignatius Ziadi, Maronite Archbishop of Beirut, The Theology of the Diaconate, Cardinal Leon Suens, Archbishop of Mecklen, Brussels, Pastoral Cooperation Between Bishop and Priests, Dennis Hurley, Archbishop of Durban, The Rights of Bishops, Ignatius Ziadi, Aaronite Archbishop Beirut, it's his second appearance. Bishops in Evangelical Simplicity, Colonel Paul Emile Lager, Archbishop of Montreal. 
<clears throat> age limit for bishops. Cardinal Leon Suen's bishops conferences today. Melkite, patriarchal vicar in Egypt. Bishops in the Roman Church. Eugene de Souza, Archbishop of Bhopal. The Supreme Senate of the Catholic Church, Maximus IV, Patriarch of Antioch, Nunciatures, Jehoiakim, Amen, Titular Bishop, Part Three: Reunion of All Christians, The Task, Pope Paul VI, Bishop of Rome, Confitior, Cardinal J. Humberto Quintero, Archbishop of Caracas, Dangers of Ecumenism, Stephen Levin, Auxiliary Bishop of San Antonio. Dialogue is possible. Casimir Marquillo, Archbishop of Saragossa. Ecumenism in England. John Carmel Heenan, Archbishop of Westminster. Clarifications. Cardinal Augustine Bia, President of the Secretariat of Christian Unity. The Ecumenical Mentality, Cardinal Raul Silva Henriquez, Archbishop of Santiago. No or oversimplification. Paul Guion, Coadjutor, Archbishop of Rennes, The Church and Open Community. I'm just going to read the titles. Man's Disorder and God's Design, Archbishop of Winnipeg. Mystery of the Whole, the History of the Church, A Voice from the East. Joseph Towell, Greek Melkite Patriarchal Vicar for the Eparchy of Damascus. We must all be converted, serving the poor together. No reunion without theology. Emile Blancat, Rector of the Institut Catholique. Intellectual humility, no fear of the truth, freedom of diversity. Mixed marriages. Part four, dialogue with the world, the task, religious liberty, Catholics and Jews, no racial discrimination, the responsible layman in the world, the church, non-Christian religions, united witness of all Christians, the missionary task, not domination, but service. Editor's preface. The Second Vatican Council, a great symbol of hope for the Catholic Church, for Christianity and the, and the world. Will it fulfill its hopes? Too much still remains uncertain. But great things have already taken place. Again, once again, we see it all the time. The Church is always talking about the Church. Evidence of this is the new atmosphere in the Catholic Church. And in the whole Christian world, a new atmosphere of openness, of freedom, of willingness to understand, of committed dialogue and mutual Christian service. Evidence of actual accomplishment is found in what the Council has already done, above all in the great reform of the liturgy, which has been def definitively accepted. It will open up a new era in the history of Christian worship, and of personal and ecclesial spirituality. I'll break in here for a moment. I think this is where the Piskies decided that they would go along with the common lectionary, which was a great dilution of the lectionary in our est preliminary estimation. Further evidence of the achievement are the important speeches given at the council which solidify the gains already made, challenge the contemporary church to action, to tell of what lies ahead. There's no better way of sensing the spirit which animates the Second Vatican Council than to read these speeches and meditate on them. Reflection on the gospel of Christ, serious resolve to reform, ecumenical involvement, honest facing of the problems of our time, sober realism, constructive criticism, suggestive qu suggestions which point ahead. All of this finds a voice in the short talks of the bishops brought together in this volume. 
for the editors, finding suitable speeches for this collection was no problem at all. The only problem was that of selection. What were the principles which guarded our choice? It was not our intention to include everything. We took as our norm a program for the council formulated with such clarity and depth by Paul VI. His four points, self-awareness of the church, renewal, reunion of Christians, dialogue with the world, provided the exterior and interior structure of our book. The appropriate section of his opening discourse for the second session is placed as a guiding light at the beginning of each section of the book. Only those talks have been included which were given in the spirit of this opening discourse. Those were expressions of doctrinaire, narrowness, narrowness, petty criticism, and unproductive defense of the status quo were by that fact disqualified. From the constructive speeches, those were chosen which took a stand on a specific problem and possessed a compact unity and completeness. Many talks which were made up of a series of short comments on different points of a schema were, despite their real excellence, less suited to a collection of this kind. In the speeches which were chosen, direct references to the text of the schemata were omitted, since the text remains sub secreto. And these direct references were of no importance for our purpose anyway. It goes without saying that none of the speeches had been published without authorization from those who delivered them. We want to thank them for graciously allowing others to profit from the doctrinal contribution they made at the council. Council speeches are not fancy oratory. They are plans for action. They are demanding challenge. Everything depends on whether these words are followed by actions. That is what the Catholic Church hopes for, what Christians everywhere hope for. That is the hope of the whole world. Rome, at the end of the second session of the Council, December 1963, Yves Congar, I don't know how to say his first name, it's Y-V-E-S-O-P, Strasbourg, Hans Kuhn, Tubingen, Daniel Ohan, and S.J. Los Gatos, Los Gatos, California. <clears throat> Pope Pius VI, dedicated to Pope John, who gave his life for the council. We cannot recall this event without remembering our predecessor of happy and immortal memory, whom we greatly love, John 23. To all of him who saw him in this seat, his name brings back the memory of his lovable and priestly image. When he opened the first session of the Second Vatican Council, Last October 11th, he gave a speech which appeared to be prophetic for our century, not only for the church, but for the entire society of mankind. That speech still echoes in our memory and conscience while it directs the paths the council must take. It frees us from all doubt and weariness which we may encounter on this difficult journey. Our dear and venerated Pope John, may gratitude and praise be rendered to you. Surely under a divine inspiration, you convoke this council to open new horizons for the church and to channel over the earth the new and yet untapped spring waters of Christ our Lord's doctrine and grace. You did not act from earthly motives nor from the force of circumstances but you act as the one who understood the divine will, one who penetrated into the dark and tormented needs of our age. <coughs> you have resumed the uninterrupted course of the Vatican Council, First Vatican Council, with its thundering anathemas. You've banished the uneasy assumption wrongly deduced from that council 
that the supreme power, powers conferred on a Roman pontiff to govern the church, powers acknowledged by that council were sufficient without help of the ecumenical councils. You summoned your brothers in the episcopate, the successors of the apostles, not only to continue the uninterrupted study and suspended legislation, but to feel united with the Pope in a single body, to be comforted and directed by him that the sacred deposits of Christian doctrine be guarded and taught more effectively. But to the principal aim of the council, you added another, which is more urgent and at this time salutary, the pastoral aim when you declared, nor is the primary purpose of our work to discuss one article or another of fundamental doctrine of the church, but rather how to expound the church teaching in a manner demanded by our times. You strengthen the country. Always themselves. <clears throat> Always. We're going to see if that changes. But it is not only truth to be investigated by reason, illumined by faith, but it is also the generative word of life and action. You strengthen their opinion that the authority of the church ought not be limited to the condemnation of errors. Rather, this authority should be extended to proclaim that positive and vital doctrine, which is the source of its fecundity. The teaching office of the church, which is neither wholly theoretical nor wholly negative, must in the council manifest evermore the life-giving power of the message of Christ, who said, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. John 6, 64. Hence we shall ever keep in mind the norms which you, the first father of this council, have wisely laid down, and which we may profitably repeat here. Our task is not merely to guard this precious treasure, namely our faith, as if we were only concerned with antiquity, but to dedicate ourselves with an earnest will and without fear to that work which our era demands of us, pursuing thus the path which the church has followed for nearly 20 centuries. Uh, what happened to the Old Testament? Did that fly off from the fly off with the birds from the bell towers? Hence that method of presenting the truth must be used, which is more in conformity with a magisterium prevalently pastoral in character. We shall have due regard for the great question of the unity of one flock, of those who believe in Christ and wish to be members of the church, which you, John, have called the paternal door, whose doors are open to all. The council which you have promoted and inaugurated will proceed faithfully along the path you pointed out so that with God's help, it may reach the goal you have so ardently desired and hoped for. Let us therefore go forward, brothers. Pope Paul, six opening address of the second session. There is a pile of sycophancy. And I wonder if that's another collateral issue. Does the church government in hierarchies foster sycophancy? God alone knows. Pope Paul VI, Christ, the beginning, way, and goal of the council. From what point, dear brothers, do we set out if we turn our thoughts to the law of God himself instead of directing our attention to the practical considerations just mentioned? What is the road we should follow? And what is the goal toward which our journey leads? The journey is made within the framework of human history, bearing all the marks of time, and is conditioned by all the limitations of our present life. Yet at every moment we must be guided by the ultimate and decisive goal which we know awaits us at the journey's end. To these three questions, simple yet altogether essential, we know well that there is only one answer 
an answer which should resound claim to the world around us. The answer is Christ, Christ from whom we begin, Christ who is both the road we travel and our guard on the way, guide on the way, Christ our hope and our final end. Well, may this council be fully aware of this relationship between ourselves and Jesus Christ. A, re a relationship which has a hundred different aspects and is always the same, which stands firm yet is the source of life and of movement, full of mystery yet limpid in its clarity, a relationship which demands much from us yet fills us with joy. And the Council be deeply conscious of this relationship between the Holy and Living Church which is really our own selves and Christ from whom we got come, <clears throat> by whom we live and toward whom we go. Let there be no other guiding light for this gathering but Christ, the light of the world. Let the interest of our minds be turned to no other truth but the words of the Lord, our one master. Let us be guided by no other desire but to be unconditionally loyal to him. I wonder what, the, when did Rudy Boltman die? He, I mean, he's not here, but I wonder what he would say to these things. Or what the Schleiermachians would say, or Von Harnack, or the whole raft of those boys. Ernst Kossman. Let the only trust which sustains us come from those words of his which shore up our pitiful weakness. And behold, I am with you forever, even to the end of the world. Would that we could at this moment raise to our Lord Jesus Christ a voice worthy of him. As the sacred liturgy says, you alone, O Christ, we know. We seek you with a pure and upright intention and ask you in our joys and sorrows to regard the feelings of our heart. Hymn of Lauds for Wednesday. As we thus invoke him, he seems to present himself to our rapt gaze with the majesty proper to the Ponto Crator, almighty, the glorious Christ of all your basilicas, O brothers of the Eastern churches, as well as those of the West, well, that's a reversal of 1054 to right there. In a certain sense, we recognize in ourself the figure of a humble worshiper, our predecessor, Honorarius II. He's portrayed adoring Christ in a beautiful mosaic in the apse of the Basilica of St. Paul. That pontiff of short stature is represented there prostrate, kissing the feet of Christ of gigantic proportions. This Christ in the likeness of a royal and majestic teacher presides over and blesses the people gathered in the Basilica, a symbol of the church. Indeed, this picture is reproduced before us not on a wall with lines and colors, but in reality. This reality acknowledges in Christ the source of redeemed humanity. The reality sees in Christ the church. It sees in the church Christ's extension and continuation, both earthly and heavenly. This recalls to our mind the apocalyptic vision of St. John. He showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, coming forth from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Apoc 22.1 <clears throat> Seems to us opportune that this council should have as its starting point this vision or mystical celebration which acknowledges him, our Lord Jesus Christ, to be the incarnate word, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the Redeemer of the world, the hope of humanity, its Supreme Master, the Good Shepherd, the Bread of Life, 
the high priest and our victim, the sole mediator between God and men, the savior of the world, the eternal king of the ages, and which declares that we are his chosen ones, his disciples, his apostles, his witnesses, his ministers, his representatives and living members together with the whole company of the faithful, united in this immense and unique mystical body, his church, which he is forming by means of faith and the sacraments, as generations of mankind succeed one another, a church which is spiritual and visible, fraternal and hierarchical, temporal today and eternal tomorrow. Venerable brethren, recall these facts of the greatest importance. Christ is our founder and head. He is invisible yet real. We receive everything from him and constitute with him the whole of Christ. The whole Christ we find expressed in the writings of St. Augustine and in the entire doctrine of the church. If we recall this, we shall be better able to understand the main objectives of this council. For reasons of brevity and better understanding, we enumerate here those four objectives and four points. The self-awareness of the church, its renewal, the bringing together of all Christians in unity, the dialogue of the church with the contemporary world. And there ends that part one, self-awareness of Christ of the church once again nice talk about jesus and then they're going to talk about themselves again which there has to be an ecclesiology but we'll see where that goes verse one of him 307 lord enthroned in heavenly splendor first begotten from the dead thou alone our strong defender liftest up thy people's head. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, true and living bread. Jesus, true and living bread. Let us pray. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever. Amen. Godspeed.